If God is good, say amen. 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 All right. Uh, I know we've gotten our exercise in today, so you are good to go. Uh, but I want to talk to you today for just a few moments about that Sunday morning, about that resurrection moment, about that time that something great happened. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 62, it says this, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together, gathered together with Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people he is risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as, as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. It was over. They buried the body of Jesus and they knew that without a doubt they had him behind a rock and a hard place. And he was going to stay there. They convinced Pilate to make sure that it was over. A huge stone, they posted guards, they put a seal on the tomb. A seal was four cords, and those four cords of rope were attached to the tomb with, 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 a, with a wax seal on each, on each rope, and, and that signified the, the fact that, that whatever was in that tomb was the property of the Roman government. Just like you get a, a letter in the mail and there's a postmark on the letter, that letter is, is yours, and no one else can open it. And so what was being said was that Jesus' body was under the authority of Caesar, and if anybody... If anybody broke into that tomb, it was a capital offense. You see, the grave was as secure as possible. But the problem was, is everybody was worried about a break-in. And no one ever considered a break-out. No one could have ever possibly imagined that the problem wasn't outside the tomb, that the real problem was inside the tomb. And that was going to cause some big problems. The tomb was sealed, shut, and nothing was going to happen. Now, I would imagine that a lot of us today live lives like that. The tomb has been sealed. It's been shut. There's no power in our lives. We've been sealed by so many things in this world. This world and Satan's got so much of a grip on us that we are entombed, it seems, for life. Some of us have been sealed with greed and lust and need for approval, and bitterness, and addiction, and pain, and anger, and fear, and selfishness, and self-pity. And all of these can lead us to imprison ourselves behind a rock and a hard place, just like Jesus. The question is today, is there anything right now on this Sunday morning that's got you sealed up? Because if there is something, today is the day to bust out. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, at the first, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I always thought Fonzie was the one that came up with set on it, but I guess he wasn't. And sat on it. His countenance was like lightning. His clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. As he said, Come, see where the Lord lay. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this passage is that when they got there, the stone was rolled away and the angel was sitting on it. The angel was sitting on the very thing that was supposed to seal up 
God was supposed to seal up Jesus. The very thing that was supposed to keep Jesus down is the very thing that the angel was setting on top of. So really, we could say that God wins his battles sitting down. Amen? We can say that right now confidently, that God can win battles sitting down. In fact, God wants to sit on top of whatever the world wants to put you under. Acts chapter 2 Verse 24, Paul is, I mean, Peter's preaching a, a sermon and he says this in Acts chapter 2, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should not be held by. If you think God is powerful today, say amen. Because that's a fact that there was nothing that was possible to hold down Jesus. Seal it up with four cords. Give it eight cords. Put 16 cords up there. Put one boulder, two boulders, 17 boulders, whatever you want to. Post as many guards as you want to. But on Sunday morning, there ain't a break in, there's a break out. And that tomb was going to be empty. See, there was nothing that could seal up the Son of God. But yet, as Christians, huh, we've all buried the power of God. Every single one of us. Every one of us has rolled a stone in front of the grave and threw our hands up in the air and gave up. Marriage is hard, so we give up. A child is rebellious, so we give up. An addiction is too great, so we give up. Finances are out of control, so we give up. We get a bad doctor's report, so we give up. See, I've learned in my life that everyone else has hope and power except me. You ever been there? You ever looked around and said, but everybody else is claiming victory. Everybody else seems to be doing good, but then there's little old me. I mean, I'm being crushed by the world and by Satan, but everybody else seems to have it together. You ever been there? You see, God wants to be over what the world wants to put you under. I think it drives God crazy that every Sunday in our churches we come here and we leave informed, but we stay in tuned. I think God is calling out to us, Get up! Get out! Break out! Drop the sin. Get rid of the greed. Stop wallowing in self-pity. Stop being so bitter. Stop being dragged down by the past. Get over it. Get over yourself. Amen? And I think it drives God insane that we do that. But many of us are buried behind a rock in a hard place. Thomas Jefferson decided to come up with his own Bible and he did some editing. He, he, he cut out a lot of things and he, and he, and he rewrote uh, the Bible in his own words. And, and Thomas Jefferson is what, what is considered a deist. That God does a lot of stuff in the beginning and then, and then at some point God's going to do a lot of stuff in the end but somewhere in the middle God's just kind of taking a vacation. Thomas Jefferson, when he writes his Bible, these are his last words of his scriptures that he came up with. There they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and they departed. End of the story. What a sad existence, right? But how many of us live like that? How many of us know people that live like that? How many of us have neighbors or family members or loved ones or even a spouse or even a child when it seems like they just rolled a stone in front of the grave and just said, I'm just done? The same power on that Sunday morning that rolled the stone away and woke up a dead man 
is the same power that lives and dwells in me and you. You can break the chains of sin. You can face death. The bad doctor, doctor's report can drive us crazy and insane, but we know, just like that man in that video that was laying in the bed, that we know that on the other side of eternity wait something that we can't even describe. And the church said, but yet we live lives entombed. Years ago at the Rose Parade, there was a float that all of a sudden stopped moving. It just stopped. It ran out of gas. At the Rose Parade, of all things, I mean, you're thinking, surely you're going to have a full tank of gas and you're going to have extra gas. But no, this float, it stops in the middle of the Rose Parade. Guess, what, guess who the sponsor was of the float? The Standard Oil Company. I mean, the float has all the resources at its fingertips, but yet it, it, it has stalled out. But look at us. We have all the power at our fingertips, but yet we deny its presence. Easter is not something to be explained, but it's something to be experienced, something to be lived out. Paul says it like this in Ephesians 1. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his call and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, listen to this, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. The bottom line is, is Paul covers everything you and I are dealing with. Everything. There's not a thing that can hold this body down. Not a thing. Nothing. But yet we live like that. Just real quickly. If we believe that Sunday morning really happened, if we really believe that the angel was sitting on top of a rock, if we really believe that, 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 that an earthquake came, the seal was broken, and the dead man rose up from the grave, here's what it's going to mean for us. It means that the empty tomb means that we will not be defined by our past. That we have to stop living under guilt and shame of past actions. I'm a sinner. I want you to turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm a sinner. You know, I'm a sinner. I've got a checkered, dark past. But that empty tomb, that empty tomb means that all of my sins have been buried with him. All the stuff that I did. Uh, I, was, I was at Hardee's in Fairview. There's not a lot to do in Fairview except go to Hardee's. And, and I think we've got three red lights there. But I was at Hardee's a few, uh, several days ago. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know why I did this, but this kid gave me my food, and he gives. He, well, actually, he gave me a number. You know, call out my food. And it was ninety-seven. Was the number ninety-seven? And he looked at me. He said, 97, That's a good year. It's a year I graduated from high school. I was like, what? And I looked at that ninety-seven. And I said, ninety-seven. That was the year I got out of rehab. He didn't know what to say about that, but. <laughs> But you know, I, I, I think about that now. I don't know about you, but I'm not defined by my past. I am not defined by that. You're not. Don't let Satan and this world label you. The label that you and I wear is we're a child of God. I'm a royal priesthood, I'm an heir to a kingdom. But some of us, it's not about what you've done, it's about what's been done to you, right? I mean, that's where it gets a little bit harder. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, it's my fault, I shouldn't have done this, but it's another thing to say, I mean, you know what, I was innocent. And this was done to me. Well, that empty tomb. 
gives you the power to get past it. Gives you the power to get through it. Gives you the power to let it go. Gives you the power to drop a grudge. Do you want to go through the rest of your life holding a grudge against someone? Do you want that person to have the power over you? It's time to drop the keys of the prison. Let it go. No one can keep you inside of a tomb. God is calling you out. Come out. Get out. Don't lay there. Get out. But the empty tomb also says that you don't have to be confined to your present. You don't have to be confined to what you're doing right now. When we are baptized, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and we have been united with the power of God and we have been delivered by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody in here is an overcomer. Today, right now, at this very moment, if you struggle with lying, you can stop it. You can stop it. You can stop cussing right now. You can stop looking at pornography right now. You can stop being a hateful, nasty old person right now because the empty tomb says that you have the power to do that. You can't overcome it. Sin no longer reigns in my life. I'm no longer in a tomb. I don't have to be confined by my present. And then finally, this is really important, is if there is an empty tomb, and I really honestly believe that, then I'm not resigned to my future. I don't have to just say to myself that I've got a, I've got a hopeless end. Because it's not a hopeless end, it's really an endless hope. I know that tomorrow is unpredictable. There's good days and there's bad days. But there is nothing standing in my way that God cannot help me climb. Satan and the world can throw a lot of junk at me right now, tomorrow. But if I believe in the power of the resurrection, I can take that hill. And the church said amen. amen. I could do it. I can do it. I can make it. I don't have to live the life of a loser. I can be somebody. I can go somewhere. I can conquer death. There's nothing, nothing that this world or Satan can do to me. If you believe the tomb is empty. Because I'll tell you right now, the tomb's empty whether you believe it or not. You just have to claim that power. There's a story, an old preacher story, Love preacher stories are all true. Uh, but this little old lady, and uh, she was well up in her years. She was getting ready to pass away, and she called for the preacher. And they sat down one afternoon, and they planned out her funeral, planned out the songs, picked out the pallbearers, talked about the dress she was going to wear, talked about the color of the flowers on top of the casket, and they talked and talked. And then she asked him, um, if, you, if you could put a fork in my right hand. Put a fork in my right hand. And the preacher said, I've never heard of such a thing. Put a fork in your right hand? Why? And she said, well, you know, you know when you go to those church potlucks and those fellowship meals and you eat the, the fried chicken, the green beans and the corn and the coleslaw and then they tell you, hold on to your fork. 
because dessert's coming. She said, I want a fork in my right hand when I die. When people go by my casket, I want people to ask you while you're standing up there, why has she got a fork in her right hand? And I want you to look at every single person that comes by my casket and I want you to tell them this, that she believes that the best is yet to come. Now, as your preacher and as your friend, I just want to tell you, everybody in this room, including me, that the best is yet to come. <laughs> the best is yet to come. I live a great life. I do. I mean, look at these clothes. <laughs> I mean, I can preach and go sell used cars, right, Steve? I mean... I live a great life, married to a beautiful woman, got three fantastic boys that are blessed with my athletic ability. You know, I live a great life. I've got a swimming pool. But you know what? The best is yet to come. I can't compare this world to heaven. I can't do it. The best is yet to come. To come. So this morning, I know that everybody in this room believes that the empty tomb has the power to save us for heaven. I just wonder how many of us really believe that the empty tomb has the power to save us today. Does it give you the power to say no? Does it give you the power to have peace and joy and gentleness and self-control? This morning we're going to sing a song of praise. And I want you to sing from your gut Sing with everything that you, get, that you have about glory to God forever. But if you are sitting there right now and you are confined in a tomb, I don't care what that seal or that chain is on the rock. I want you to come forward and we will pray you through it. We will pray you through it and get you out of that cave that you're living in. The best is yet to come. Please come in the front.